Chapter Thirteen of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Thirteen, Karangarua River continued. Bad weather. Twain Gorge. A Maori arrives. Douglas returns. Karangarua Gorge. Lame Duck Camp. Douglas again ill. Head of the river. A lonely Christmas. Allowing the river another day to reach its proper level, I left camp on the 21st, and, fording just opposite, went up the north bank of the Twain to see if a route was practicable on that side. These rivers are glacier streams, and very cold indeed to ford. After a long crossing, like the one opposite camp, which was about eighty yards of actual wading, the cold made one's legs sting painfully. Though we had to ford creeks or river four days in a week during the work in the lower part of the valley, we never really got used to it, and always found the stinging cold very disagreeable for a few minutes. The weather, at this period of our work, was so bad that it would be monotonous to record my daily experiences. The 20th and 24th were wet days, but very cold, so the river did not rise enough to prevent a certain amount of work. On the 21st and 23rd, I made trips into the Twain Gorge, trying first a high-level and then a low-level route along the north bank, and in each case was stopped by a bluff or terrace of smooth ice-worn rock, some two hundred feet high, facing up the valley and running obliquely from the top of the range down to the water's edge. A party of three could no doubt find a route through the gorge with help of a rope, but for one man it proved too difficult to make it practicable. About seven miles along the Karangarua range from Mount Sefton is Mount Glorious, which sends off a spur in a southwesterly direction for about four miles. The spur divides the Twain Gorge from the valley of Regina Creek, and is the only offshoot worth mentioning from the Karangarua Range on either side. The slopes of the range and the spur are smooth, and lie at an angle of thirty-five degrees, showing here and there large patches of ice-worn rock and high bluffs. The soil all along this slope is very thin, and has in many places slipped away, leaving the bare rock. On the north bank of the Twain Gorge, the vegetation consisting of large trees, has only a foot or two of soil in which to grow. In several places in the bush there are large bare faces of rock, and the trees seem to have formed a network of roots to help one another to stand. The high-level route took me a mile into the gorge at a height of 1,700 feet above the water, and the lower one I could only follow a very short distance, as the above-mentioned rocky terraces, which ran down obliquely to the course of the river, kept forcing me up before a way over them could be found. The view of the gorge, from the furthest point I reached, was very imposing. The opposite side, which had proved too much for us before my companion left me, showed a bare face of perpendicular grey rock of hundreds, nay thousands, of feet, with a ledge or shelf here and there, on which some trees found a precarious foothold. Several springs of water were to be seen, shooting out from the rock face for a foot or two, and then dropping downwards, would be lost in space, only reaching the bottom as spray. During the second attempt, I was fortunate enough to witness the effect of a thunderstorm while in the gorge, an experience I should have been very sorry to miss. The echo and re-echo of the thunder from those vast precipices, combined with the mists swirling across their faces, can never be forgotten, and the effect was intensified and appeared far grander, because I was alone. How feeble one's pen feels when attempting to describe such wondrous scenery as this. The Twain Gorge, with its awful grandeur, Regina Creek, with its beauty of a quieter sort, and the Karangarua Gorge, with its fantastic surroundings, require a form of word painting entirely beyond my powers. Again, the charm of a quiet evening after a storm, in the midst of such wet and boisterous weather as we had at Bark Camp, has to be experienced before it can be realized. When sitting out on the river bed below the camp, listening to the murmur of the river, the weird cry of the cacas flying across the valley, the clear note of the tui, and more familiar sound of the English blackbird, which has found its way into these solitudes, and when looking at the picture of blue ice-water flowing round a dark bush-covered island, backed up by a gloomy gorge, through which the ice-capped summits of the higher mountains could be seen, lighted up with a warm glow by the last rays of the sun, I used to feel that in spite of my loneliness I was to be envied. The absolute peace and restfulness of such an evening is better appreciated after a hard day of climbing and rough work, 
alone, forcing one's way into an unknown gorge, or after a long spell of stormy weather, such as there had been lately, when the very elements seemed determined to hinder one's attempt to push ahead. While smoking in quiet contentment, and looking at the magnificent surroundings, one would mentally picture other similar evenings, by no means uncommon, in other localities, and wonder why one never got tired of such things. I suppose a true lover of nature never does tire. On the evening of the 26th, I was sitting in my ragged clothes over the fire, and having been unable to make those three lower notes sound on the flute, I decided to have some songs. While singing, as only a man can sing when he knows there is no one within miles of him, I was startled, in the middle of a verse, by seeing a yellow three-legged dog, and then a Maori, emerge from the darkness into the firelight. Both were evidently very much amused at the picture they had seen before I noticed them. This proved to be Ruera Timahi, or Bill, as he is more commonly called, and he told me that, quote, Charlie, Charlie Douglas, he say you fell go up find Harper, end quote. Having given him some cocoa, which he said, make very good tea, I asked him if he had any letters or papers for me, to which he replied, like all Maoris, oh yes, plenty time. However, I was not prepared to wait so long, having been without news for nearly six weeks, so I unrolled his load, and to my delight, found a great roll of papers. Graphic, Detroit Free Press, Strand Magazine, Weekly Times, Pall Mall Budget, and Sketch, etc., also letters, and some fresh meat and onions. Douglas was coming up in a day or two, as he was better, and Bill was to go on with us in order to help him with his load, as he was determined to reach the head of the river. On the twenty-ninth Douglas arrived, not really fit for work, but as plucky as usual, and we had seven days of uninterrupted rain by way of showing him what it had been doing for the past month. However, the budget of papers gave us plenty to read, and the time did not hang heavily on our hands. At last, on the sixth of December, the weather cleared, having been exceptionally bad for six weeks, and raining on thirty-three days out of forty. From this date till the end of summer, the season was as good as we could wish, and fully made up for the previous long spell of rain. Since it was not possible to take our impedimenta through the Twain Gorge from Castle's Flat, it was quite evident that, in order to explore its headwaters, we should have to find a route into the valley by some saddle higher up the Karangarua Valley. In 1893, Messrs. Fife and Graham had crossed from the Muller Glacier into the Landsborough Valley, and finding that river too rough to follow, had gone up the McCarrow Glacier and dropped over a saddle onto a small flat, but had not gone any further, returning to the Muller Glacier again. From the photographs and their description, we knew that they had reached the head of the Twain Valley, but had not attempted to follow it down. We therefore decided to push on up the Karangarua River and get into the Landsborough Valley, and from thence into the Twain River, and coming down it, join on the traverse at or near the point I had reached from Bark Camp. Another route equally good would have been up Regina Creek, and over the spur into the Twain Valley, but there was no advantage in taking that line. Sending the Maori down to Scots with a mail, and to get a few odds and ends, I went up the river, and crossing Niblick and Tui Creeks, cleared a track through the gorge. It was a difficult and rough piece of work, taking three days to reach the more open valley above, a distance of three miles, of which only one and one-half mile required a track, and was responsible for the whole three days' work. The route, after mounting a steep broken slope, overgrown with tangled vegetation, had to be taken along above the walls of the gorge, some two hundred feet above the river, and below high overhanging cliffs of black rock. The two or three creeks which flowed into the river here dropped over the precipices in fine cascades, having pools between each fall, and wherever the water flowed the bare rock had been exposed, showing only two feet of soil on the surface. There will be terribly large landslips some day in this district, because the hillsides are very steep, and the soil has little hold. In the pools between the waterfalls we found some cockabullies, a small fish of three or four inches in length, unhealthy, black-looking beasts, with bullet heads. One pool had five or six in it, and was between two waterfalls of about fifty feet, so it was rather hard to understand how they had got there. Douglas tells me he has seen these fish climbing up the wet moss at the edge of a waterfall, evidently finding sufficient moisture from the spray. They are also to be seen on the move in very heavy rain. Some of these same fish have been found in the water at the bottom of a deep shaft on the Ross Goldfield. 
the river descends eleven hundred feet in this gorge over two large cataracts which have been formed in the same manner as those in the other branches by great boulders filling up the narrow rock-bound channel and preventing the water from cutting the valley floor down to a lower level above the upper cataract the valley opens out and has on one bank the south a terrace of hard nice rock three hundred feet high at the top of the cataract which gradually becomes lower as the floor of the valley rises until it ceases altogether some two miles further up the river the opposite bank has a series of rocky bluffs with good shingle beaches and small grass flats between them and affords good travelling on december eleventh the maori and i took a light camp up to a spot i had chosen a quarter of a mile above the gorge on the twelfth i sent him back to bark camp to bring another load and help douglas over the track while i pushed on up the river to reconnoitre the camp we were now in was rather an awkward place to be caught without stores in bad weather for in order to return to our head camp it was necessary to ford the river which ran deep against the rocky side and cross two large creeks had the river risen a foot it would have been impossible to cross and one's retreat would be cut off we therefore called this camp the rat trap about a mile and a half above here the river has cut a most fantastic gorge through the rock the sides are some forty feet high and in places approach to within three feet of one another while the water has worn a very tortuous channel for itself the banks resemble two pieces of rock which have been roughly dovetailed and not placed quite into position between these walls the water is twenty feet deep in places and very clear on emerging from the gorge there is a small flat two thousand eighty three feet above sea level which seemed a good place for the next camp and was surrounded as usual with high rock peaks from one of these a fine waterfall theodore falls descended in four leaps over rocky precipices from a height of seventeen hundred feet this flat i named lame duck flat because jack the maori's dog pursued a duck which had young ones and nearly killed himself by going over a waterfall into the gorge when a pair of ducks have a brood and danger threatens the female goes away with the young ones and the drake draws the pursuer after him in the opposite direction by pretending to have a broken wing most dogs know that it is only pretense and make no attempt to follow but poor jack gave chase and for nearly half an hour was now swimming and now running on his three legs on the river bed while the drake kept just five yards ahead of him at last the bird drew him towards the gorge and before i could prevent it jack was over a waterfall between rocky walls however i believe that dog had nine lives for he reappeared lower down grinning as usual but looking very foolish next day i went down through the big gorge to bark camp and on the following morning the fourteenth we all returned up to the rat trap camp bill and i with heavy loads on the fifteenth we moved camp again to lame duck flat and while the maori made two or three trips down to bark camp for stores i went on up the river alone with a fly leaving douglas at lame duck camp with a bat wing passing through another troublesome but beautiful rocky gorge i put up my shelter a mile and a quarter further up the river at the point where a large tributary which i named troit river joins the main stream this drains mount fetz eight thousand and ninety two feet and flows through an imposing gorge between towering mountains half a mile after the troit stream joins the river it flows through a short gorge of twenty chains at the lower end the rock sides form a great arch over the water which is twenty yards wide at this place and approach to within six feet of one another at a height of forty feet from the river an almost complete arch and sixty yards above this the two sides actually touch from below the water to fifteen feet above the river here goes down in a whirlpool on the upper side and bursts up with a furious seething and bubbling on the lower side evidently having only a narrow passage below the water line this must be a wonderful sight in a flood starting from troit river camp early on the morning of the eighteenth of december i pushed on through some bad travelling to the head of the river and climbing two thousand eight hundred feet reached the saddle five thousand six hundred and forty one feet leading into the mccarrow glacier about noon a short climb down a snow-filled couloir of three hundred feet brought me on to the glacier about a mile above the terminal face having thus proved that a practical route could be found into the landsborough valley i decided to return at once down the river to see how douglas was getting on and by dint of some pretty fast going reached lame duck camp at dark 
after a day of fifteen hours. Here I found poor Douglas quite unable to attempt further work, and reluctantly making up his mind to return to Scots. It was very hard luck, because he had explored, or shared in the exploration of, every river on the west coast, from the Wataroa to the Sounds, and had set his heart on reaching the head of this, the last unexplored valley. However, he showed his usual pluck by swallowing his disappointment without grumbling, and the next morning began the return valley. Sending the Maori down to Scott's two days' journey, Douglas and I made a long day, and were able to reach Bark Camp at dark, as we had nothing to carry. Douglas was to wait here till Scott sent up some men, and a horse to the footer, in order to help him down, for he was really not able to walk much, having had to be carried over the creeks and river by me the day before. Leaving him therefore in good quarters, with instructions to the Maori to bring up a load after me, I returned to Lame Duck Camp with a load of four days' stores, to leave at the Rat Trap for use on our return, after finishing the Twain and Lansborough Valleys. Having to fix a station on the north side of the valley, the next morning I went down to Coleridge Creek, a large tributary flowing into the river just below the Dovetail Gorge, and draining a small patch of ice on the top of the range. The hillside here is bare rock, for some 2,500 feet above the river, varying from 32 to 36 degrees, off which the whole surface of soil and scrub has slipped. The slope was too steep and smooth to attempt in my boots, so I dispensed with them, and found that bare feet made the walking quite easy, though the slope was rather steep in places. On reaching 1,300 feet above the river, I sat down to take bearings, and was greatly amused at poor Jack, who had accompanied me. He was looking at me in a very reproachful manner, and trying his best to sit down, first with his head uphill and then down, but of course, a slope at such an angle is not an easy seat for a quadruped, though he could walk up it well enough. However, five hundred feet higher there was a small tarn, ten yards in diameter, on a shelf in the rock, and here he was happy, while I was making further observations. Going down again was rather difficult, but beyond one approach to an involuntary glissade of some nine hundred feet, the descent was uneventful. Leaving two pounds of oatmeal, a tin of hare soup, and one of jam, under a stone at the camp, for use on our return, I made my way to Troit River Camp, taking all the things up in one load. While passing through some bad boulders, which at two places completely bridged the river, I nearly came to grief by trying to get through a hole formed by two of these monsters, lying against one another on the top of a third stone. The opening roughly resembled a single oriel window, about four feet from the ground, and narrow. Therefore, I put one leg through, and lifting my arms over my head got my shoulders through, but the load proved too large and became firmly jammed. Owing to the position of my arms, I was unable to get back, or to reach the sheath knife in my belt to cut the shoulder straps, and I could not use my legs, for they were both off the ground. After some three or four minutes of pulling and straining, which seemed more like an hour, I began to fear that I should never get out, but one more desperate effort was successful, and I extricated myself with numb arms, and pretty well exhausted by the brief struggle. There is no excuse for this mishap, it was gross carelessness on my part to risk the chance of sticking in a place like this, when alone. The proper plan, and the one which I generally adopted, was to get through the opening first, and pull the load after me, instead of endeavouring to pass with a load strapped on my back. Like all other dangers, it was a case of familiarity breeds contempt. From Troit River Camp I tried to follow the Troit stream down through the gorge, but without success, as it was rock-walled with cliffs of three hundred and four hundred feet in height, and full of waterfalls. To go up this branch would require a climb through the scrub, over the spur forming one side of the gorge. I therefore made a climb on the north bank of the Karangarua, and was able to overlook and make all necessary observations for mapping the Troit Basin. Mount Fetz, 8,092 feet, with a small hanging glacier, lies at the head of this stream, and shows a magnificent rock face of some 4,800 feet, cut up in ridges, buttresses, and couloirs. To the right, about two miles up from the junction, a low saddle shows where Jacob's, Makawiho, River, takes its rise, which flows behind Mount McGloin, and reaches the sea eight miles south of the Karangarua. On Christmas Eve, I took half my impedimenta up to a small flat, 2,803 feet, under the saddle at the head of the river, a journey of a mile and a half, taking a good three hours, and leaving them in shelter returned to camp that evening, where I had some observations to make. Not particularly relishing the idea of spending Christmas under a sixty-pound load, and over bad travelling, I decided not to begin festivities until my shelter was rigged up on Christmas Flat. 
Leaving Troit River, therefore, at 5 a.m., I reached that flat at 8 o'clock, and had the camp pitched two hours later, and having brought up a small piece of suet and a few raisins, on purpose for Christmas, I made a pudding and had it boiling by noon. When everything was snug, I shook hands with myself, wished myself a Merry Christmas, and offered my congratulations on reaching the head of the river. I then produced the flute, and, sitting on a stone near the fire, so that I could watch the pudding, struck up a Christmas tune or two, but, as the three lower notes were still silent, the only part of the tune that my audience could hear was the part that happened to wander amongst the upper three notes. My audience, which, by the way, consisted of two wekas, I killed, after the concert was over, and prepared them for my evening meal. It has since been insinuated, by kind friends, that the audience probably died from the effect of the performance. The best mode of roasting a weka is to make an opening at the back of his neck and clean him, then get a stone about an inch in diameter, and having made it red-hot, put it inside the bird, and, passing a stick through his body, stand him in front of the fire to roast. When the bird is cooked, in about half an hour, we plant the stick in the ground and proceed to carve slices off as it stands up in front of us. My Christmas dinner consisted of five courses, namely, Weka's liver and heart on toast, roast Weka, one onion, deviled Weka's leg, plum duff, three dry figs, and I ventured to say that, though I had no brandy for the pudding, and the suet was too old and made it taste tallowy, I spent as happy a Christmas as most people. But I confess that a man must have succeeded in reaching the head of his river, after some pretty rough work, before he can really appreciate a duff made of bad suet. After a short smoking concert in the evening, I hung the remains of my socks on a branch over my head, and turned in. But I suppose there were too many holes in them, for in the morning the contents panned out, very poorly, a little hoar-frost only. It must be admitted that a man must be rather a maniac before he can enjoy these sorts of discomforts. Bill, one day after he had rejoined me, put on my cap by mistake, and found it too large, so he said, You fell got Perry tick head. Possibly he was right, and that may account for my enjoying this solitary Christmas. Just after I had hung up my socks and turned in, I heard a shout down the flat, and on going out found that the Maori had arrived, having slept at Lame Duck Camp the previous night. We therefore put up a shelter for him, by the light of the fire, near my own quarters, and made another brew of tea, before finally turning into our blankets. He had a good load of stores, and a grand budget of papers and letters for me, which I spent the next day in reading, for, owing to my custom of going about barefooted, when anywhere near camp, I had burned my instep, and was unable to put on a boot, or do any work. A most tantalizing invitation was amongst the letters from Mannering, who, writing in November, stated that a large party were to be at the Hermitage for Christmas, and were anxious for me to find some Passover and join them. This would probably be easy to do, had my companion been any good on hills, but he proved to be of little use, so I dared not attempt a high pass with him, and had to give up the idea. The newspapers contained news of the Tsar's death by cable and were more than six weeks old when they reached me. The Maori made a first-rate companion, and his English was amusing. It was rather like Chinese pidgin English. He always said, I me, for I, and you fell, for you. He could not pronounce the letter R, but always substituted L, and many other little peculiarities. For getting birds he was capital, and, if any were near, he and his dog Jack always found them. The only drawback was that he was painfully slow, and no good on hills or rocks so I had always to leave him in or about camp, and do the high work alone, sometimes a risky performance. One thing which interested me greatly when he arrived was that he said, You fell son of white man? I asked him what white man he meant. Oh, the white man long time ago he come down with Terapuhi. By this, of course, I knew he was referring to my father, who was the first white man to cross from the east coast to the west. In 1857, he went over at the head of the Hurunui River with a few Maoris and explored the coast down to the Haast River, as it is now called, but having written very little about it, the expedition had been practically forgotten. Bill, however, told me he was a little boy and that his father took him up to Okarito to see the white man, and the old chief, now living at Jacob's River, told him, when he was coming up to join me, that I had the same name and might be the son of the white man. On the 27th, I sent the Maori up to a rock on the saddle, to leave a load of stores under it, 
and leaving camp at 4.30 a.m. myself, I made an ascent of Mount Howitt and another peak, Cairn 4, between the Karangarua and Twain rivers. By 6 a.m. I had topped the range, some 3,000 feet above camp, and after spending an hour or more observing and photographing, I went along the arete between the McCarrow Glacier and Twain River to the latter point, 7,400 feet above sea level. The climb was uninteresting from a gymnastic point of view, but being alone, I had to be careful of the large snow cornice on the arete and of some rather steep ice. Also, on the return in the usual fog about noon, it was difficult to see my way down the steep and rotten rocks for a short distance. But topographically, the view was grand. The Twain Valley could be seen over 3,500 feet below, walled in on the left by immense cliffs, which extended from the source down to the gorge by Castle's Flat. Across the valley the Karangarua Range, with Mount Sefton at its head, could be followed down to the junction of the Copeland River. On it is the large ice field of the Douglas Glacier coming off Mount Sefton, and then a high offshoot, which I named Pioneer Peak, divides the Douglas from the neve of another fine primary glacier, the snout of which was seen sweeping down a tributary valley into the Twain. This, which I christened the Horace Walker, with some smaller glaciers, which I named Wilkes, Pilkington, Morse, Fitzgerald, and Fife, drains into the Twain River, and accounted for the volume of water seen at Castle's Flat. To the south, the Landsborough Valley could be traced from the McCarrow for some thirty miles, and peak after peak of the dividing range towered up, like the teeth of a huge saw, carrying a little snow and ice, but forming some fine rocky summits. The 28th we spent on the saddle, completing the observations for the Karangarua Valley, and also bringing stores to place under shelter of a rock up there, in order that on our return from the Landsborough to the Twain, we should replenish our supplies as we passed up the McCarrow Glacier under the saddle, thus avoiding a descent to Christmas Flat. The ascent to the saddle was an easy one, up an open rough creek for 1,200 feet, and then 1,000 feet or so over open grass slopes covered with large erratic boulders. The creek ran at the foot of a huge precipice of ice-worn rock, the top of which was rather higher than the actual saddle. Beginning at nothing just above the saddle, this cliff became higher as the ground sloped down to the flat, until it was 1,500 feet high. A waterfall, the Sisters, came over this in one leap of 800 feet, halfway up the slope to the saddle, and formed one of the sources of the Karangarua. Four other creeks flowed down in various directions, and joined on Christmas Flat, draining small snowfields on the hilltops. Very stunted and thick mountain vegetation grows for 600 feet on the lower slopes of the hills, and in places on the flat itself the scrub was fairly thick, and grew to a height of 10 or 15 feet. The greater part was, however, open grass and young scrub, which we burnt. We also fired one or two spurs. At the head of a valley, if the weather was dry enough, we generally fired the scrub, but rarely got a good burn. It never grows again when burnt, and thus, in the future, a few open spaces may delight the heart of any other maniac who tempts providence by following in our footsteps. End of chapter 13「Fourteen of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter fourteen. Landsborough River. Into Landsborough Valley. New Year's Day. No birds. Starvation rations. A forced march. Hast Pass track. Return up river. Broderick's Pass. Back at Christmas Flat. It is always best to camp, if possible, near some scrub, in case of bad weather, for it would be very wretched to be without a fire for two or three days. From the Karangarua saddle, it seemed that four hours good travelling would be necessary before the first scrub was reached, which meant about seven hours from Christmas Flat. Accordingly, on the morning of December 29th, I sent Bill away at six o'clock, and followed three hours later with light loads. Unfortunately, instead of two hours to the top of the pass, he took nearly seven, finding the climb, quote, too tipi, steep, peri luff, end quote. Consequently, instead of leaving the pass at 11 a.m. for our descent into the Landsborough, we did not leave until 2 p.m. On looking over the stores on the saddle, I saw that we should be running very close to short rations, unless we had luck, for there was a distance of at least 25 miles to go down this valley and after the return there was the Twain Valley to do. 
The trip down the Landsborough and back, I calculated, would take at least eight and perhaps ten days, but as no one had been into the valley since it was first explored some years ago by Douglas, we expected to find an unlimited supply of cockapos. It would not therefore be necessary to take much food. These birds, as stated previously, live only in districts covered with birch forests, and the whole of the country from the Landsborough to Jackson's Bay, and even further, is birch country. About five years before, a party, of which Mr. Muller, then chief surveyor of Westland, was a member, led by Douglas, made the first exploration of the Landsborough River by the North Bank. During that trip, the whole party of six had only carried a little flour and limbed entirely on cockapoes, which were so plentiful that Douglas says they, quote, had to tie the dog up. She caught too many, end quote. The river is unfordable from the moment it leaves the glacier, and hitherto no one had traversed the south bank, so I had every reason to anticipate no trouble in finding birds, for we should be the first to travel down that side. Accordingly, I decided to leave as much food as possible under the rock on the pass for our two days' work on the Twain River. We therefore took seven or eight pounds of flour, some tea, sugar, a little chocolate, cocoa, and treacle, enough to last us with luck and birds for ten days. In fact, so certain was I that we should have no lack of birds, that I almost decided to take nothing but tea and sugar. In addition to the food, we had camera, instruments, a blanket each, field books, ice axe, eight by ten fly, a small axe in case it was necessary to cut a tree for sparring a creek, the homemade light loads of about thirty-five pounds. The Maori no likey, the climb down the snow couloir, but the rope eased his mind greatly, and when he got on to the glacier below, down which we had to go for nearly a mile, the poor old fellow was very unhappy. He pushed one foot gingerly along in front, and brought the other up to it, and so on, having grave doubts whether the ice would bear his weight. However, in a quarter of an hour he felt happier, and when he got on to the surface moraine, he, like he more, and stepped out like a man, being quite convinced that he was off the glacier. I here unroped, and was pushing ahead, when I heard an exclamation behind me, and found that the Maori had stepped on a piece of thinly covered ice, with the usual result of sitting down with more speed than grace. On turning round to get up, he saw that he was still on ice, and with a most ludicrous expression of surprise he said, Golly, I me tink no more ice. When we ultimately reached the lateral moraine, he was still very doubtful and fully expected to find ice cropping up somewhere. I do not know if any one has had a Maori on a glacier before, but imagine this was the first time that one has been on alpine rope, and, considering all the superstitions concerning the ranges that Maoris have, I consider Bill showed uncommon pluck in facing it as he did. I could see he was in a regular funk, but he showed his courage by setting his teeth and not betraying it, except by his color, which was yellow. Below the glacier for two miles, the river runs between high terraces, in a channel cut down through old moranic and other deposits, there being a large grassy plateau, 4,300 feet above sea level, on each side of and 300 feet above the river. This is covered with large erratic blocks, and is cut through by the Spence Creek at one mile, and Leblanc at two miles, which flow from the glaciers of those names between high terraces. These two glaciers are both near the river, and the streams from them are black with slaty silt, and rush down over large boulders at a great pace. Both gave us considerable trouble to ford, and the latter especially being really dangerous enough to be unpleasant, for we had to step on to large stones a foot under water, between which the stream was deep, and owing to the dirtiness of the water we could only find the next stone by feeling with the ice axe. The stream was running like a mill race, which made it the more difficult to make a sure step. Here, at 3,520 feet, we found the first burnable scrub, and made a rough shelter with a piece of canvas under a rock about sunset, having taken thirteen hours over a journey, which could have been done in seven hours, had my companion been any good in rough country. The Maori worked like a man and did his best, but owing to short-sightedness was painfully slow. It was fortunate that I had made a point of reaching a place where we could have a fire, for it rained for two days but we were not at all happy as there was only room for one of us to sit up at a time however bill was peri tiffy stiff so he was not sorry to lie down most of the day the reason of this discomfort was that we could not find any poles to pitch our fly properly 
Had we been in a better place for timber, we should have been happy enough. On the moraine of the Mercero, I had killed a kia with a stone, but had seen no other birds, consequently our flour began to dwindle rapidly, and by the end of the second day we had little left, though limiting ourselves to a small slice of bread per meal and a stick of chocolate. On the last day of 1894, my diary states that, quote, This is a poor game when caught in bad weather, under a stone where only one can sit upright at a time. We can neither return nor go on. Everything is in flood. When limited to two small slices of bread a day and no birds, the fun begins. Bill and I have been talking of our first kakapo all day and are beginning to doubt if any birds exist. Menu for the last dinner of 1894. Quote, a conversation about kakapo and wekas, dessert, a slice of bread and cup of cocoa, end quote. The shelter we named Musk Camp, because here our only firewood was mountain musk, as it is generally called. It is a scrub of the myrtle species, of a sage green color, and grows to a height of four feet. The leaves, when burnt, smell very like incense, and are not unpleasant to mix with tobacco. It only grows above the 2,500 feet level, a pure alpine shrub. There is another kind, of which I have only found two specimens, with a large leaf and slightly different scent when burned. This I call the incense plant, and found it in the Douglas River, near the Margent Glacier. Also one specimen in the Waiho country. To burn a little of either shrub in a room has a delightful effect, and is much liked by those who have had it brought to them from the ranges. The former is found on both sides of the divide. January 1st, 1895 was dull, but the rain had stopped, therefore we pushed on down the valley. A few miles below Musk Camp, on the northern side, a fine glacier sweeps down off Fett's Peak, right into the valley to 2,950 feet above the sea, having its terminal face for a quarter of a mile washed by the Landsborough River. About four miles from the camp, a very large creek from the Arthur Glacier, on the dividing range, descends in a series of cascades through a fine gorge, and then bursts out over great stones into the river. We arrived here at 3 p.m. and found it uncrossable, so built a shelter for the night, hoping it would be lower next morning. We dined off one skinny kia and a quarter of a scone each. Bill felt peri sore inside, making knee peri weak, but it could not be helped. A rough day after breakfasting off a conversation concerning wekas is not easy work, and to have to finish it with only a mouthful or two of kia and bread is trying, to say the least of it. About sunset, we heard wekas, kiwis, and kakapos within fifty yards of us, across the river. The Landsborough has a mighty volume of water in it, and rushes down at a great pace in its rapid descent. It is unfordable from the glacier for thirty miles of its course. It spreads out onto large flats at this point, and could be forded by a horse, if such an animal could by any chance be brought to the spot. Consequently, unable to cross the river, we had to sit and listen to the birds quite close to us, and hunger in silence like Tantalus. Quote, Egens benigne semper dapis, end quote. On the morning of the second, thanks to a hard frost in the night, the creek was four inches lower and enabled us to cross by jumping from boulder to boulder, most risky work, but accomplished without accident. A mile or so below camp I saw a weasel in the bush close to the river, which explained the absence of birds on this bank. Weasels have been turned out over the Haas Pass by some officious person, and have found their way all along the south bank of the valley, but so far have not been able to cross to the other side. Soon after midday we reached the first piece of flat travelling, and continued to meet with small flats, between a mile or two of rough travelling, until the evening when we camped opposite Mount Dechen, some eight miles from, and 1,283 below, the last camp. We got no birds, and were pretty well done up for want of food, having to breakfast and dine off the same conversation, and a small slice of bread, about four by three inches. Next day we again moved on and travelled till 6 p.m. over extensive flats of open Pakihi land in the birch forest, with short stretches of bad travelling in between, and one or two nasty creeks to cross. At 5 p.m. we found three wekas, and as soon as we came to a good place to camp, in about an hour, we kindled a fire and had the three birds roasting on three sticks, and with three hot stones inside them. In half an hour they were standing up in the ground in front of us, while we cut, sliced, and devoured them, in another half-hour three sticks were all that remained, 
Jack, the Maori, and myself, having given a very good account of ourselves. A weka is equal to a common or garden fowl, so three birds between two men is a fair meal. I had very little to guide me, as to the whereabouts of the pass I was to report on, and did not know where it could be on this side of the range, but from instructions received before starting up the Karangarua, I imagined that it would be near this camp. However, Bill's boots were quite worn out, and even had we plenty of stores, it would be folly, if not cruelty, to make him attempt a return journey in such footgear. I therefore decided to push on down the river next day. About fifteen miles below here, the Haast River joins the Landsborough River, flowing from the Haast Pass, 1,800 feet, over which a transinsular horse track has been formed for some years from the west coast to Otago. On the beach at the mouth of the river, 25 miles from the junction of the Haast, is a store, and the same distance up the valley track from the junction would take us to Stewart's sheep station in Otago. Mr. Stewart had been the first to cross the pass, on which Sir Julius von Haast afterwards placed his own name, in the early sixties, and put cattle on the very extensive flats which are found at the junction of the two rivers, three hundred feet. To reach these flats and the track which skirts them involve fifteen miles of rough travelling, interspersed with long stretches of level going. I decided to go on as far as this track, and then either to go over to Stewart's station or down to the store on the beach, in order to get Bill a pair of boots. I had heard, however, that part of the track was to be repaired during the summer, and was in hopes that we should find a road party at work, who could perhaps satisfy our wants, and save the extra twenty-five miles. I intended to go alone, but Bill did not care about being left in these solitudes, so we both set out on the following morning, leaving everything in our shelter. The travelling seemed easy, unburdened as we were, but a climb of eleven hundred feet over a bluff was trying to us after our long fast. This is a good illustration of the trouble caused by bluffs on the rivers, where a spur descends toward the stream, and ends abruptly in a cliff, at the foot of which the river flows deep and swift. After ascending and descending eleven hundred feet through bush, we emerged five or six hundred yards only from the point at which the climb commenced, or two hours' work, and little over a quarter of a mile gained. It was dark before we reached the great flats, at the junction of the two branches, but we managed to find an old hut near the track, the remains of one of Stuart's mustering fares, in which to pass the night. At eight o'clock next morning we were wakened by a blast of dynamite, about two miles away, and knew that for the present our spell of short commons was over, for a road party was at work on the track. Leaving Bill to follow, I hurried across the wide flats and riverbed, forded the host stream, and in an hour was near the road camp. Here I met one of the men, and he would not believe that I had come down the Landsborough, terra incognita to them, but thought I had come over the pass from Otago. However, he soon saw something was wrong when he took me along to his tent and saw me sampling a cold stew, for I could not wait until he had cooked a meal. When I explained that the two of us had travelled forty miles down the river, and had only two kias, three wekas, and a little flour between us, in eight days, he said that accounted for my eating a, quote, cold, greasy old stew, end quote. It also accounted for a good hot meal, which he had ready for me when the stew was finished. I knew Mr. Nightingale, the overseer, so went on and found him, but he did not know me at first in my rags, and with four months' growth of hair and beard, nor did I recognize myself when he gave me a looking-glass. The Maori turned up in due course and ate twelve large cold doughboys, suet dumplings, while waiting for something to be cooked, and like me, he, quote, feel Perry gland quite full, end quote. We spent four days in this hospitable camp, and were fed up like two turkeys being prepared for Christmas. It will perhaps be remembered that Bill brought me some old newspapers when he rejoined me at Christmas camp, after having taken word down to Scots about Douglas. Consequently, as there were then rumors of complications in Europe resulting from the Tsar's death, I was anxious to know whether I belonged to England or Russia. The men at this camp, being on the track, were able to get a mail every fortnight, so they were only two weeks behind in their news, and had papers of more than a month later date than those the Maori had brought me. During our first evening, sitting round the campfire, I asked what the news there was, and was told by one man that Jackson and Corbett, or some such names, had decided not to fight. So I said, Is there no other news? 
and was informed that there had been no news for months. However, on looking at the papers, I found them full of the mail reports of the Tsar's death, not short cable messages and reassuring cables that the general peace was not likely to be broken. This had apparently not been worthy to be called news, as compared with a possible prize fight. This, however, is the same all the world over, for I recollect, when quite a small boy, going to England via San Francisco in 1878, the last news from Europe as we left Auckland said that, quote, war inevitable between England and Russia, end quote. On arriving at Honolulu then, the only port of call, a Russian man-of-war lay near the entrance of the harbour, and my parents were most anxious to have the latest news. When the pilot came on board, there was such a rush that my father could not get near to him, so waiting until he got an opportunity, he said to one of the passengers, Well, what news? To which the passenger replied, Confound it, his name begins with a P. The rush had not been to ascertain whether war was declared, or whether the man of war was going to cut off the mails, but only to settle a sweepstake on the pilot's name. It was most amusing to see Jack's behavior here. When we arrived, he was as well behaved as possible, and did not attempt to steal, but he was only waiting to find out which camp we were going to patronize. As soon as we had established ourselves in Mr. Nightingale's camp, he began to thieve right and left from the other tents. It is owing to this failing that he lost his leg some months previously. Bill caught us plenty of eels and weckas, which were plentiful here, and prevented the double strain of our presence from affecting the stores of our hosts to any extent before the packer came up from the beach with more provisions. The Maori's boots were quite worn out by the time he reached Nightingale's camp and we had a good deal of trouble to get another pair. The packer arrived in due course, and returned to the beach for a few stores for us, but could get no boots, so Bill had to content himself with two old odd ones belonging to some of the men. Having got these, we started on our return trip up the river on January 11th, with a few pounds of rice and flour. The Maori took two days over the journey, as I wanted him to catch some birds on one of the lower flats but I pushed on and reached camp the same evening, doing fifteen miles in eleven hours, which is pretty fast going. The camp was one thousand and three feet above sea level, and seven hundred and fifty above the junction of the Haast. In 1890, Messrs. T. N. Broderick and Sladden crossed from Lake Ohau in Canterbury over a low saddle of four thousand three hundred feet, and descending to the Landsborough River, stayed a night in the valley, and returned to the Canterbury side of the range. As already stated, I did not quite know where to look for this saddle, but on going up the river to the camp, I crossed three open grassy flats absolutely alive with rabbits, and then a fourth and fifth without any of these vermin. The small flat on which we were camping was the sixth, and this had literally thousands of rabbits, the ground being as bare as a barrack yard. When we reached this open space and came out of the trees onto the grass, it seemed as if the whole surface of the ground turned a somersault in sections. In such countless numbers were the rabbits diving into their burrows. The ground looked honeycombed. The fact that there were two grassy flats free of bunnies between this point and number three flat showed that they had not come up the river. Therefore, they must have come from the eastern side of the range via some low pass, probably Broderick's. Having left the pea rifle at Christmas camp, and owing to the extreme shyness of the rabbits, we could not have got any had we wanted them, and the three weckas caught on our arrival here, on the way down, had saved us the trouble of a possibly useless hunt. There were none on the smaller flats above this point. The next day was too foggy to attempt an examination of the high country, so I hunted weckas and snared two or three, while the Maori, who arrived in the afternoon, brought four kakapos and two weckas, a heavy load. The thirteenth was a wet day, but we got nine more wekas a little farther down the river, and spent the fourteenth, which was again wet, in smoking them for future use. Having lost our salt, we had to depend on smoke. We now had enough birds to last us till we reached the stores on the pass. The fifteenth I spent in ascending Broderick's saddle, which, as I anticipated, was above the camp, and the rabbits must have come over by that route. I also looked at another low pass more to the east, but neither was of much use for a road, being too precipitous. The view into Canterbury was very extensive, and I gloated over the grand open grassy hills for some time, before descending again to the terrible west coast scrub and forest. 
There was, however, no reason to complain of the bush in the Landsborough Valley, because, like all other country covered with birch forest, it is fairly easy to travel in. The bush is fairly open, with fine timber, clean-limbed trees of five and six feet in diameter, and little undergrowth, and when the grass line is reached at 3,500 feet, there is none of the usual mountain scrub. The trees merely become smaller until they cease. From near Broderick's Pass, I took several photographs, which were unfortunately spoiled by damp, like so many others this year. I had to leave the boxes of exposed plates sometimes for weeks, under a stone or other shelter, to be picked up on our final return to habitation, and the damp marked them rather badly. A grand view of the Hooker Range was to be seen from this spur, Mount Hooker, 8,644 feet, across the valley with its great horn of rock, rising out of fine ice fields, looked as if it would give some trouble to ascend. The pure white ice dome of Dechen, 8,500 feet, some ten miles up the river, has a snow line of under 5,000 feet, and except for innumerable Berkshrunds, would make an easy climb. Dechen is, I think, one of the most beautiful snow domes or cones I have seen. It rises at a gentle angle which gradually becomes steeper at the top, and in its perfect symmetry almost reminded one of the volcanic cone of Taranaki, 8,260 feet, in the North Island, though the actual cone only began at 4,000 feet. Beyond Dechen, the rocky pinnacles of Strachan, 8,359 feet, rose out of sundry fine secondary glaciers, and a little further away, Fett's Peak, 8,092 feet, showed his fine rock peak, an equally hard nut to crack as his neighbor, from a climbing point of view. Miles away to the northeast, I picked up the footstool, Sefton, and Dwarf, which lie at the head of this and the Karangarua River. 4,000 feet below, the valley could be followed for 20 miles, the first few miles having a broad flat bottom with many large pakihis or grass flats, through which the river twisted here and there, flowing close against the base of a spur, dividing the different flats. Gradually, however, as the eye wandered up, the valley became narrower, till at last no flat places appeared, but each spur descended right into the river and formed difficult and rough travelling. On the immediate right hand, Mount Mackenzie, over 8,000 feet, raised his rocky summit, with hardly a vestige of snow or ice, a miniature Matterhorn, which, with his shattered rocks, would be a troublesome fellow to climb on this side. At 3 p.m. a storm of rain wetted me to the skin, and compelled me to descend to camp. On the way down, Jack caught me two cockapos, but the climbing being beyond his powers by the route I took, he went home by the line we ascended, so no further birds could be found. On the 16th we went up to our third camp on the down journey, and had reached a point halfway to Arthur Creek the next day, when more rain compelled us to camp. Here I made another ascent on the 18th, but beyond obtaining some observations and photographs, there was little worth mentioning. We had two empty treacle tins, which we brought in case of necessity, and these we filled with the oil of the cockapo. This liquid is of a light straw color, and though not as good as weka oil, is very nourishing. As I knew we should find ourselves short of flour, till we reached the rat trap, on our return down the Karangarua, I saved all the oil I could to mix with the flour. It is a good, though not very palatable, way to economize. The Maori was very happy now, for we had unlimited food, having not yet finished the smoked wekas, and because I got one or sometimes two kakapo on each ascent. They seemed to have been all above the bush line at this time of year, which accounted to some extent for our bad luck on the way down the river. One evening, sitting over the fire, Bill mentioned a man whom he had seen at the road camp, and said, He never poor. Never poor, I replied. What do you mean? He always fat, never poor. Of course he's always fat, you old fool, I said. When once a man is fat, he generally remains so. To Maori, said Bill, he's sometimes poor, sometimes fat. He no tucker, he peri poor, but belly full, he peri fat, same as to hen. He meant by this that a Maori gets in good and bad condition in the same way as a weka does, according to his food. I laughed at the notion at the moment, but on looking at my companion next day, I saw that his dusky old face was now shining like a copper kettle, and he looked like a well-groomed horse, in a ragged cover, certainly, but still well-groomed. A fortnight previously, he cut a sorrowful figure and looked in wretchedly poor condition after the short spell of starvation. 
I have since been told that the change is quite noticeable amongst Maoris, according to their food. The 19th was cold and wet. The snow was quite low down, but we pushed on in order to cross Arthur Creek before a warm wind came and caused it to flood, and getting over far more easily than before, we made a rough shelter opposite Fett's Glacier in a storm of sleet and rain. On the following morning there was little improvement, and we travelled on and crossed the LeBlanc stream, also very low, owing to the cold and bivouacked out on the grassy plateau, 3,993 feet, about a mile and a half below the McCarrow Glacier, reaching there about five o'clock. The day had cleared during the afternoon, and the peaks began to show, as the clouds slowly disappeared, and by sunset they were all visible, looking glorious in their coating of fresh snow. This was a wild-looking sight for a bivouac, a great grassy basin of two miles by one, with great erratic blocks scattered over it, surrounded on three sides by towering rock and ice-capped peaks, down which avalanches would thunder every half-hour, making poor Bill start and look nervously round over his shoulder, for he never got over his fear of the avalanche thunder. While from a hillock behind we could see miles down the gradually darkening valley of the Landsborough, in descending which, three weeks before, we had had such a bad time. As the darkness closed in, we gathered some stunted vegetation, which grew in tufts here and there, a few inches high, and coaxed the billy until it boiled, and sitting down, watched the last three of the smoked wekas being cooked. They had to be all cooked that evening, as Bill informed me. They were a bit long, i.e. high, but they were none the worse for that, luckily, as we always had good appetites. As usual, when we trusted to the weather being fine, and put up no shelter, it began to rain as soon as we had rolled into our blankets, and with equal cussedness, no sooner had we put the fly up on a rope between the ice axes than it stopped again, and the stars shone out. The Maori explained this by saying, He come, he see over de hill, he say, Golly, two men no camp, he lane, he see again, he say, Demfell have camp, he stop. We were therefore able to use the canvas as an extra blanket after all. Bill's boots were again nearly done for, so instead of going directly into the Twain River, we returned on the 21st over the Karangarua Pass to Christmas Flat, taking some of the stores from the depot on the saddle. It was hardly worth while spending three or four days in going down to Castle's Flat for more stores, though we only had bare provision for a week left. It may have been foolish to risk another starve in the Twain Valley, but I venture to say that most persons would have acted as I did and risked it, instead of going down and up that awful river again. This is one of the occasions on which I cursed my fate at having to do such hard work with only one man, and I am afraid I sometimes wished those who were responsible could have had a few of our experiences before refusing us a third member of our party. However, the twain was still in front of us, so we could not afford to waste time. Accordingly, we only spent a day and a half at Christmas Flat to allow Bill to make himself some Maori sandals, or parara, out of flax. These do not last long, but are capital footgear for ordinary riverbed or other travelling, one pair a day being about the average. On sharp stones, however, as will be seen, they are soon cut to pieces, and three pairs will only do a day's work. Bill was convinced that three pairs would be sufficient for the Twain River, so he made five and left two at the camp when we started on the following day. I spent my day off in washing and generally mending my rags, which hardly resembled clothes, and making a few extra observations, in order that no time need be wasted when we came back out of the Twain River. The geology of this district forms an interesting study, and I greatly regretted my ignorance on that subject. Of course, we brought in hand specimens every day, which we looked upon with little favour when they increased to several pounds in weight, for though a fifty-pound load weighs fifty pounds, I am sure it is heavier if there are twenty pounds of stones in place of twenty pounds of food. These specimens, which have been collected for years by Douglas, and during the last two years by me, are from every valley and almost every range of the southern Alps, on the western slopes, from the Waiho River to Jackson's Bay. They are all in the Hokitika Survey Office, labelled and classified according to their locality, with a dip and strike of the rocks noted on each one a most valuable collection, which should enable a geologist to do good work. When these will be made use of, I do not know, 
but only hope they will not die the death of most things which find their way into a public office. Generally speaking, the main dividing range of the southern Alps is composed of a reddish sandstone and a great deal of slate. In fact, the prevailing rock is slate at most of the places I have crossed. The outer ranges are schist and gneiss. The junction of the two formations is generally near the divide. In the district at the south of Mount Sefton, however, the slate formation appears to extend from the dwarf across to the Hooker Range, and to continue along it for some twenty miles, where it again crosses on to the dividing range. The latter seems to be of schist formation, from the dwarf to near Broderick's Pass, and then again runs into the slate formation. The Landsborough River, down to this point, follows the junction of the two formations, the valley having schist on the east and slate on the west side. About Broderick's Pass, the river, however, leaves the schist formation, and has cut through the slate, and, sweeping round, has found its way to the sea on the west coast. This would lead one to suppose that the Hooker Range is the original dividing range, and that the water of the ancient glacier found its way eastwards. Of course, it requires a geologist to decide this point, and many other interesting points, but at present no geologist has been into the west coast ranges. A great deal that has been written on the subject is pure guesswork, and in some cases quite incorrect. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 15 Twain River, Karangarua. Douglas Pass, Head Basin of Twain River, Douglas Glacier, Camp, Horace Walker Glacier, Moraines, Lower Valley, Hasty Retreat, Bivouac, A Night with the Typo, Return to Habitation. From Cairn 4, on December 27th, I had been able to examine the Twain Valley, from Douglas Glacier to the Great Gorge, and could see that we should have a long day's work, with the Maoris slow travelling, before a suitable camping place could be found in that valley. I therefore decided to sleep near the saddle on the night of the 23rd of January. Leaving one day's food on Christmas Flat, and taking the remainder of our stores, now reduced to sufficient for four days, with reasonable luck in birds, we ascended the slopes toward the saddle, and having found a fairly level place, 1,298 feet above camp, slept out on the grass. At 5.45 a.m. on the 24th, we again moved off, and dropping over into the McCarrow Glacier, went about a mile and a quarter up the ice to a saddle, the Douglas Pass, 6,115 feet, on the north side, reaching it at 10 a.m. Here I had to spend two hours making observations, and continuing a short distance further up the glacier. The formation of the country is most peculiar here, and needs a word or two of explanation. As already stated, the Hooker Range branches off from Mount Munga, and runs to Mount Howitt before turning in a southerly direction. The Douglas Pass is a high saddle over this part of the range, but lies only twenty or thirty feet above the McCarrow Ice. On the Twain side of the pass, however, there is a steep slope, cut up into ice-worn rocky terraces, descending for 1,550 feet onto a small gravel flat half a mile wide by one mile long. Thus, this offshoot of Mount Monga seems to me an imposing range from the Twain, but from the McCarrow Glacier appears merely a low rocky ridge rising out of the ice. From the pass the view is weird and magnificent, as indeed is the whole of the Twain Valley, though very limited in extent. Looking northwards, we had on our right and left a ridge rising sharply from us towards Mount Monga and Cairn 4, respectively, and forming the saddle. To the right front, a deep short ravine, surrounded on three sides by overhanging black cliffs, on the top of which several small ice fields are scattered, and keep up a running fire of avalanches, forming in the bottom a moraine-covered glacier, which I called after Mr. Fitzgerald, who was in New Zealand at the time with his guide Zurbringen. Forming the eastern end of the ravine in which this glacier lies is the dividing range, well over 8,000 feet, Mount Monga, a very graceful two-horned peak rising at its head. The glacier flows for a mile between the enormous cliffs to the edge of the small gravel flat, 4,562 feet, across which the stream flows to the foot of some immense terraced precipices, which form the left of the picture, 
and flowing along their base finds its way out of the flat at the northern end under the moraine-covered ice of the douglas glacier which flows past the opening of the basin on the north straight in front of us lay the grand neve of the douglas glacier coming off mount sefton which stood in all its white majestic grandeur framed by these dark and gloomy precipices this great ice-field lies on the sloping rock roof of the karangarua range and is bounded on the east by mount sefton and the west by some precipices five thousand feet high rising up to the summit i named pioneer peak when on cairn four it is nearly four miles long and slopes down to the top of a long sheer black precipice varying from two thousand feet at the west end to one thousand feet at the eastern end over which ice avalanches constantly fall and to form the trunk of the glacier in the valley nearly four miles in length consequently we have the peculiar picture of a neve running along parallel with the trunk of the glacier supplying it with avalanches over great cliffs and not any single point having direct connection with it the simplest way to form some idea of it would be to imagine an ordinary lean-to with a roof about three and a half miles by one and the back wall averaging five hundred feet the neve lies on the roof and drops its ice over the back wall forming the glacier which flows along the base of the wall and for half a mile beyond it the approximate area of the ice field lying on the roof is two thousand five hundred acres it is probable that a body of water like the marleyan sea by the alleged glacier was at one time in possession of this basin fed by the fitzgerald glacier and upheld by the douglas as it flowed past the northern outlet of the flat when i met fitzgerald and zurbriggen later in the season i could not help regretting that they too had not seen this wonderful sight which of its kind is the finest scene in our alps and i doubt if it can be surpassed anywhere looking to the south the view was cut off by the spurs of the dwarf but the fine sweep of the mccarrow glacier as it curved past under the great precipice from the karangarua pass and mount townsend was beautiful beyond the pass fetz as usual showed prominently his fine peak reminding me very much of the weisshorn at noon we began the descent into the twain and i had the most trying bit of work of the season for not only had the loads to be lowered down on the rope over the rocky faces but the maori and his dog also poor old bill did his best but is not a mountaineer he is only an honest maori who was never built to do alpine work we had the pea rifle with us and managed to shoot two kias on the way down a short quick tramp took us across to the northern end of the flat and four hours three of which were occupied in going two miles over the worst moraine i know brought us at seven p m to a small flat a quarter of a mile below the douglas glacier where we rigged up a rough shelter near some stunted scrub three thousand six hundred feet above sea level the maori's sandals of course made him very slow and were cut up quickly by the sharp stones of the moraine and the last of the three pairs he had brought with him came to pieces on his arrival at camp while making our shelter of scrub we got four wekas and though without salt or sugar indeed we were getting used to it now had a good meal the first since six a m and were soon asleep in our blankets on the twenty fifth i went down the valley to the terminal of the horace walker glacier three thousand five hundred and eleven feet about a mile below camp and skirting along its great lateral moraine traversed the grassy and rocky slopes until i could see through the great gorge into castles flat having completed the lower portion of the valley i descended to a most interesting system of lateral moraines near the horace walker this glacier flows from a basin formed by pioneer peak and the karangarua range and descends in a westerly direction for nearly two miles and then sweeps round until at its terminal face it is almost flowing in an easterly direction the whole roughly forming a large horseshoe at the point where it comes out of its valley it has formed a very fine lateral moraine on the outer side of the curve and behind this moraine is the perpendicular series of smaller moraines mentioned above from the top of the present lateral moraine on one side to the ice is over one hundred feet and on the other to the river there is about four hundred and fifty feet descent about the middle of the curve on the river side of this lateral moraine and sixty feet below it there is a series of semicircular moraines with great gaps or openings in their sides like gates in an old roman fortification and in front of each such opening a small moraine has been thrown up as if to cover the entrance to the fortress these small terraces are ten to twenty feet high and extend in curve after curve for two hundred or three hundred yards in the widest part 
until there is a large unbroken semicircular moraine which falls away nearly four hundred feet on the river side but is only thirty feet high on the inner side of the fortress it would have been an ideal place to defend in ancient days and really seems to have been built by human hands each earthwork being thrown up with great accuracy i find some difficulty in accounting for these old moraines for they are lower than the present lateral had they been higher there would be good reason to suppose that the glacier at one period of its existence took a wider sweep before turning up the valley there may have been a large terminal moraine thrown across the valley by the ancient ice flow of the douglas glacier and the horse walker being unable to cut its way through has been turned in its course i am not however prepared to allow that these great moraine deposits belong to the douglas glacier but am of opinion that the horace walker has been responsible for them entirely it is more than probable that the ice originally flowed directly down its valley and came out at right angles to the twain forming in the first place an outer moraine across about two-thirds of its terminal face and having its outflow at the other side where the moraine did not exist and then retreating a little way deposited another great moraine partly terminal and partly lateral which now forms the high lateral moraine this was followed by a considerable shrinkage until the glacier was smaller than it is now and then a period of advance set in causing the ice to flow down against the old terminal moraine and being unable to push it aside turned along its base and flowed down to its present position had this been the case the glacier would have the old terminal moraine along its side and make it appear to be a lateral moraine otherwise i am at a loss to account for the easterly curve of the glacier up the valley unless some such old moranic deposit caused it to do so the natural course would appear to be down the rapidly descending main valley of the twain river from point h above this lateral moraine a general view of the valley can be obtained and the wonderful precipices bounding it on the south are seen to advantage from the douglas glacier to castles flat the whole of the southern side is walled in by rocky precipices descending from terrace to terrace for two thousand and even three thousand feet at the base of these the river flows having formed here and there a small flat of an acre or less behind the short buttresses they can hardly be called spurs of the range about a mile and a half after it leaves the douglas glacier the river is joined by the short but deep stream from the horace walker ice and a mile further having passed along the foot of the moraines of that glacier it descends rapidly through a narrow and deep gorge apparently it has here encountered a rocky bar across the valley and has cut a narrow black-looking channel of over two hundred feet in depth at the lower end while at the upper end where it first encounters the bar it has only been able to wear away a shallow channel of a few feet on each side of the gorge is a level floor of water-worn rock and at the lower end the walls cannot be many feet apart i had not time to go down and inspect this place closely lower down the valley after another deep but short gorge between two picturesque rocky bluffs has been passed the precipices as it were retire back from the river and rise out of a gentle slope of debris which lies at their base for three or four hundred feet and is covered with vegetation above this slope the cliffs are more sheer than before and in places look as if they had been rough hewn by human hands for hundreds of feet after flowing along the foot of the short slopes for a mile the river turns to the left and descends rapidly over the great cataracts through the gorge to castles flat on the northern side of the valley the karangarua range rises gently at an angle of about thirty degrees broken here and there by terraces of rock and its grassy slopes evidently having little hold on the rock underneath for spaces of smooth rock can be seen where the soil has slipped or been washed away above the horace walker stream is a grassy flat of about twenty acres on which numerous heaps of old moraine are to be seen and after passing along at the foot of the terrace another flat is to be found higher up the valley of similar size at the edge of which we were camping for a quarter of a mile between the camp and the glacier there was a confused mass of moraine hillocks and large erratic blocks more or less covered with stunted scrub and beyond this again filling the upper portion of the valley is the moraine covered trunk of douglas glacier three thousand six hundred and sixty three feet flowing at the foot of black cliffs parallel with its grand neve which descends like a great white mantle from mount sefton's mighty shoulders during the day i had been rather anxiously looking out for some flax to take back to bill with which he could make some more parara 
and at one time I feared there was none growing in the valley. If there had not been any, it would have been very exceptional, for it grows as high as any other mountain scrub. It would have also been most awkward, because Bill could not have gone back barefooted. However, on the Horace Walker moraines I found some, and cut enough for all purposes, for I wanted some for the bread also. This year, when away from Castle's flat, I used to knead the flour on a flax mat, and bake the bread on a flat stone over the fire, which turned out, perhaps, better bread than the frying pan. Having cut all the flax that we were likely to require, I set fire to the scrub on the old moraines, little thinking that I was starting more than an ordinary conflagration. The scrub, however, was dry, owing to a prolonged spell of fine weather, and burnt for three whole days, filling the valley with a dense cloud of smoke, which was seen, so I heard afterwards, over Mount Sefton at the Hermitage. This burning of scrub will benefit any future expeditions, for it never grows again, and will leave a few open patches in unexpected places. On the way down from camp in the morning, I had avoided the Horace Walker stream by crossing on the ice, but as I was now traversing the main river, up along the side, I had to ford the stream near where it joined the river. It has a very rapid descent, and was dirty, and fairly high after the hot day, so I found it rather awkward to cross, and when just in the centre I trod on a large loose stone and fell over. Luckily, my hands came on to another stone near the surface of the water, so I was able quickly to recover my footing, but had they gone into deeper water, nothing could have saved me from being washed out into the main stream, which was rushing along toward its rapid descent into the gorge. The Twain is unfordable in the summer, from the glacier to Castle's Flat, and like all other such mountain torrents, it would kill a man by dashing his head against a boulder before it drowned him. The cold of the water is, of course, intense. Even where it joins the Karangarua, miles below the glacier, the temperature was just under 40 degrees Fahrenheit. When at Bark Camp on my return, I measured the daily rise and fall of the river in fine weather, due to the melting of the ice up the Twain. The stream at that point was about 80 yards broad, and the rise and fall varied from 3 to 6 inches in the 24 hours, according to the temperature of the day. No doubt, if such measurements could be extended over a long period, some interesting figures could be recorded as to the melting caused by the sun in summer and winter. My measurements only extended over three days, and were therefore of little value. Arriving at camp about 7 p.m., I found that Bill had cooked the rest of the birds, which we found on the evening before, but had failed to find any more. On the 26th, I was again working in the lower part of the valley for nearly ten hours. These long days of heavy climbing were hard work, as the Maori was no good on the hills, and had to be left in camp. Also, I had to carry twenty-five pounds of instruments, cameras, and books all day, a constant handicap. In fact, ever since the beginning of December, all the high work had to be done alone, and I had no companion on any expedition from camp on the mountains. Bill spent his day in making sandals and looking for birds, but had no luck, so we were again reduced to small rations. We had only brought enough stores into the Twain to last us for four days, if we got plenty of birds. In fact, we were practically depending on the latter entirely, and the little flour, etc., was not equal to more than one or two fair meals. No one had been into the valley before, Therefore, birds should have been plentiful, as they were in the Karangarua Valley. But not only did we get none, except the four above mentioned, but also those four were too poor to be of much use. There was still work for two days to be done, and I dared not risk being caught in bad weather here, because our retreat would have been cut off. So instead of taking a day off on Sunday, the 26th, I went up the Horace Walker Glacier to the foot of the ice fall. Though of no great size, this glacier is very fine, and has only one small patch of surface moraine on it, about a mile from the terminal face. Before it reaches the Twain Valley, it is bounded on the northwestern side by fine precipices of 900 to 300 feet in height, on the top of which a large secondary glacier lies, and drops frequent avalanches onto the trunk of the Horace Walker. This upper ice field I named the Pilkington Glacier, and it comes from a nice-looking peak. Mount Glorious, and forms a snow saddle between the Twain and Regina Creek valleys, draining partly into the latter. The neve of the Horace Walker is of considerable extent, and lies in a basin formed by the Karangarua Range, and the short high spur on which is Pioneer Peak. A fine icefall between high cliffs connects it with the trunk. Had there not been several photographic plates and some notebooks left in various parts of the upper Karangarua Valley, 
I should have endeavoured to pilot the Maori over the Pilkington snowfield into the Regina Creek Valley, making an ascent of Mount Glorious on the way. From that peak, a view into the Copeland Valley could be obtained, and much useful work done. But it was not a fit climb for one man, and my companion was not equal to it. He was willing, but utterly unable to do these things. How I regretted that Douglas, or some good man, was not here with me, wondering why this work was not considered worth the additional slight expense of a third member to our party. On returning to camp, I was aware that had the Maori found no birds, our meal would only consist of a small slice of bread, and I could see by Bill's face that he had found nothing, so did not ask any questions. When the billy had boiled and tea had been made, I took the last scone but one out of the bag and quartered it, one piece each for tea and one piece each for next morning. These scones were round and six inches in diameter by nearly an inch thick, so it can be seen that a quarter is not a sumptuous repast. To my intense surprise, Bill said, I mean no hungry, and refused his quarter. I knew he had not eaten anything all day, any more than I had, because there had been two scones in the bag that morning. I therefore exclaimed, Not hungry? That's all humbug. I me big feed today, said Bill, belly full. Me feel gland. What did you have? I asked. Oh, plenty food. You fell half bleed, he said. I me had Maori hen, weka, very good. I knew this was not true, because there were no feathers round the camp, so I said, You old sinner, where are the feathers? But he stuck to his point and replied, You fell work all day, I me lie down all day, and have good sleep, sleep, and no hungry, you fell half bread. It was evident then that the old boy wanted me to have all the food, because I had been working, and go without himself, having tried to tell a lie about the weka, but protesting was no use. He still held out and said he was not hungry. At last I said, All right, old man, if you can't eat that bread now, put it aside till tomorrow. You are not going to starve yourself for me. We are both in the same boat. This did not satisfy him, but after half an hour I saw him take the bread and eat it quietly, as there was evidently no chance of my taking it. I could not help being touched by his unselfishness, which fully corroborated the many stories we hear of what fine characters some of the old Maoris have, quite different to the younger generation of natives, I fear. So far the weather had been cloudless and perfect, but a great change appeared on the following morning. Instead of the beautiful clear blue of the New Zealand sky, there were high, black, windy-looking clouds drifting from the northwest, the forerunners of bad weather. The effect of an approaching northwest storm is very grand in the high ranges of the west coast. It first shows in the shape of high, light, filmy clouds, which drift slowly over and far above the dividing range, gradually thickening and closing together, until they appear like a coal-black curtain against which the eternal snows of the Grand Peaks stand out with weird distinctness. A few hours after this black-looking pall has passed behind the range, ragged and torn clouds roll in from the sea at a level of from 4,000 to 6,000 feet, and cover everything, bringing with them the rain. Accordingly, I could see that we should be fortunate if the weather remained fine for even 24 hours. Hastily swallowing our quarter scone and cup of tea at 6 a.m., we rolled everything up preparatory to a quick retreat out of the valley. I gave the Maori most of the things to carry, and sent him on up the moraine-covered glacier to the small gravel flat under Douglas Pass, and followed with the instruments and camera, making rapid observations, and carrying the traverse up the trunk of the glacier. On reaching the flat about 2 p.m. I spent two hours traversing it round, fixing more stations, and going a little way on to Fitzgerald Glacier, and at 4 p.m. returned to the large rock at the northern end of the flat, near the moraine of the Douglas, under which we intended to bivouac if necessary. By this time, however, the rain clouds had obscured the main peaks, and I was unable to fix the point from which my baseline was to start, so reluctantly decided to make the best of a bad job and stay here in spite of the storm and no food. From this flat we could retire to Christmas Flat at a pinch in any weather, but at the camp below Douglas two hours' rain would have cut us off completely by flooding two creeks which we had to cross. Rather than go away, leaving the work incomplete, I determined to stay on this flat for another day at least, though there was only enough grass to boil the billy with difficulty. By sunset we had chained the baseline and turned into our blankets, having eaten a quarter of the last remaining scone. 
I shall never forget the grandeur of that night, and I do not think the Maori will either, though for a different reason. Within fifty yards of us the hillside rose sheer for nearly one thousand feet, and then in tiers and ledges for the same height, above to near Cairn 4, and looked as if it might at any moment fall forward and annihilate us. Half a mile away the Douglas Neve sent down its ice avalanches all through the night, sometimes twenty-five, sometimes thirty in the hour. These crashed down with a sharp report like a great gun, echoing and re-echoing from cliff to cliff, surrounding that great basin. The thunder of one had hardly died away before the next began. And then at midnight the storm burst on us with its peals of thunder and its vivid lightning, adding to the noise of the avalanches and causing an indescribable din, as the crash of the thunder and roar of the avalanches echoed from the surrounding precipices, sounding as if all the demons of ancient and modern times were loose. Poor old Bill, no likey. And during the hour or two after midnight, while this overwhelming noise was going on, I believe he was calling all the gods to witness that he would never come into such a place again. Every now and then, with a nervous laugh, he would say, I me tinky typo, devil, here. Fortunately, at three a.m. it had calmed down, so I got up and saw that the mists were lifting, giving me an opportunity at four o'clock to fix my baseline. At seven a.m. we ate the last quarter of the remaining scone, and rolling up our loads, went over to the foot of the ascent to the pass. The mist, however, would not give me a chance of seeing the proper route, till we had waited for an hour or more, but at last an opening gave me the line to take, and we began our climb. The rope was necessary three or four times to give my companion and his dog a help over the rocks, but he travelled well, and needed much less nursing than on our descent. After reaching the pass, descending the Macaro Glacier, and dropping over the Karangarua Pass in a thick, wet mist, we made Christmas flat in the afternoon, having got three kias on the way. Here a glorious stew and a large feed of porridge soon made us less hungry, and helped us to enjoy the luxury of even a batwing after our long spell of a month in makeshift shelters. The three days of starvation in the Twain was my fault entirely, for I deliberately took the risk, instead of going down to our depot for more provisions. However, I believe that anyone in my place would have done the same, that is, taken the risk, rather than going down the river and punching up more stores over that rough ground. The 30th of January was very cold and wet, snow falling round the camp, so we stayed in our batwing by a good fire all day. On the following morning we went down to Lame Duck Creek, as there was nothing to eat at Christmas Flat, having given up waiting for the few additional observations I had hoped to obtain, for the weather was still bad. Here we were again amongst our friends the birds, catching three ducks and two weckas. On the first of February we again moved on, reaching the rat trap in the afternoon, where I stayed for four days, having to make a climb on each side of the valley. I sent the Maori down with part of our impedimenta to Bark Camp, on Castle's Flat, telling him to bring back some sugar, flour, and salt. It may be remembered that we left four days' provisions at the Rat Trap, on our way up the river, but of these the flour had turned black with damp, and the jam was fermenting in the tin. On the Maori's return he stated that there was no sugar at Castle's Flat, a great disappointment, as it was now more than two weeks since we had any. Consequently, I was tempted to eat the jam which, owing to fermentation in a tin, may have become poisoned. On turning the pot round in my hand, however, I saw a guarantee by the maker, Kirkpatrick of Nelson N.Z., that his tins were especially prepared, and no chemical action could be produced by fermentation. So I decided to take the risk, for we were hungering for something sweet. I suggested to Bill that we should toss up, as to who was to try it first, but he laughed and said, "'You me both eat.' We therefore each took some, and between us finished the whole of it. Next morning I had forgotten all about the jam, when Bill suddenly said, You me, no dead, jam no bad. This reminds me of an occasion some weeks before, on which the Maori lost his footing, and fell over a sheer drop of fifteen feet, onto some rocks below. I did not hear him fall, but was astonished by a shout from below. I me no dead, I me right. And on making investigations, we found he had fallen onto his load which, as is usually the case, had turned him over onto his back, and he was practically unhurt. On the 4th of February we went down to Bark Camp and spent two or three days, generally washing up, patching our rags, bathing, and posting up the field books. 
the maori had a complete change of good clothes here but mine were at scott's so i had to do the best with my present rags it was little use trying to mend my nether garments for they consisted of canvas patches fastened together by other patches very little of the original stuff remaining but care enabled me to make them sufficiently decent to appear at Scott's by binding them round my legs with flax. When Bill put on his good clothes, he looked a terrific swell beside me, and I told him so, saying, Well, Bill, old man, they'll think you're my master. But he would not admit it. Oh, no, he said, you fell to boss still. On the seventh we wended our way down to the low country, and calling at the foota for a pair of boots which I had left here in November, those i had on having completely come to an end we arrived at scott's farm in the evening just a day or two over nineteen weeks since i last saw a habitation for i had been in the ranges ever since we originally left on october first eighteen ninety four and never been nearer to it than the futa during that period end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of pioneer work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter sixteen Karangarua District Pleasures of Habitation My New Companion A Climb on Scott's Hill General Features of the Country Ancient Glaciers Rotit Koiti Alpine Vegetation Insect Life at High Altitudes The Pleasure of Such Homely Food as Potatoes, Cabbages, and other vegetables, with mutton and bread, cannot be realized until one has been without them for months. Since October the previous year, I had not had any vegetable except ferns and a few onions, and our bread had been either ordinary damper, flour and water, or soda bread. The cream and milk, too, seemed far better than any I had ever tasted. Again, a man must spend a long period away from habitation before he can thoroughly appreciate a chair and table for we had with us absolutely no luxury, nor had we an army of porters to carry tents, bedsteads, mattresses, etc., but had to content ourselves with some scrub branches or ferns to lie on, and a log in front of the bedding, about four or five inches in height, to sit upon while in our shelter. It may therefore be easily understood that a chair and table for our meals were very welcome, after months with the plate, when we had one, balanced on our knees while sitting on a log. It must not be supposed that I am bemoaning the discomfort of the work, because, though it might be rough and uncomfortable to the average man, I did not find it either the one or the other. But the comfort of even a rough farmhouse in South Westland is welcome for a change. It is also worthwhile to have hair and beard several inches long, in order to have the pleasure of a good crop, even with a pair of sheep shears. When we arrived at Scott's in February, I could tuck my hair under the collar of my shirt, and my beard was long and tangled. I found Douglas very little better, and only able to walk a few yards. He had been confined to his bed for some weeks after he had returned. It was perfectly useless for him to attempt further work, so we got a young fellow, Dick Fidian, recently out from England and digging at Hunt's Beach, to accompany me. I regretted afterwards that he had not been sent up to me when first Douglas came back in October, for he was a capital mate and plucky, which is more than can be said of the man who left me at Castle's Flat. He was also a good walker, and had the makings of a climber, so would have been, on the whole, preferable to poor old Bill. The Maori evidently had an exaggerated opinion of my powers, because not only did he give the road party on the Haas Pass track an extraordinary account of my climbing, but he went to see Dick, and warned him that the work was pelly luff, rough, and also saying, you fell no follow Harper into hills, too teepy, Tate up. Oh, yes, said Dick, I can manage, if he helps me with the rope. Well, you fell. See me light, you no follow. See the monkey climb to pole? Asked Bill, working his hands and feet to indicate one of those toys that run up and down a stick. Yes, often, said Dick. Well, Harper, he just the same as the monkey. However, Dick decided to come in spite of the Maori's wonderful yarns, and I could not have had a better companion than he proved to be. Instructions came from Pokatika to say that they had decided to try a saddle at the head of the Copeland River for a track to the Hermitage, in spite of the fact that it carried perpetual ice. I was to send in my map, etc., of the Karangarua country first, and then go over to the Hermitage via the Copeland River and report. 
this is the line i and others had wanted the authorities to examine for some two or three years past so these instructions were very welcome accordingly dick and i went up to bark camp and brought the stores and other things which were there to the footer and then sent up horses from scott's to bring everything down to the flats and crossing the river moved them up to a mile below the inflow of the copeland or further if possible here dick was to camp and blaze a track up the spur to the grass line on ryan's peak which we had to ascend later for some observations while i plotted and sent in the map mr scott has a few sheep on the hill on the south of the river where it flows out of the ranges and finds the snow grass above the bush line very good pasturage in the summer he had however left the animals there too long the previous season and was unable to muster owing to the winter snow having driven the sheep down into the thick scrub hearing that he was going up again i decided to accompany him and go back along the ridge to get a good view over castle's flat and other parts of the river for a few more observations and photographs leaving dick therefore to continue the track up ryan's spur i went with scott up the sheep hill and pushing back we camped at the head of the manakao creek which flows out near jacob's river one of the party was a young maori dan koiti who was an excellent man on the hills and he told me that a month previously he had followed some sheep back further than any one had been and found a large lake doubting his story somewhat i went with him next day to a place where we could see not only the lake which did exist after all but also an extensive panorama of the ranges while dan went down to the water and back to our bivouac by another route i spent my time in completing the observations etc from this point r a view of all three branches could be obtained and an accurate idea formed of the size and direction of the vast ancient glaciers which evidently filled these valleys the country appeared more weird than it did when we were up the river the gigantic rock precipices and smooth slopes showed to advantage and the very narrow ridges in evidence everywhere proved how hard and solid the rock was the peculiar conformation of this district was also plainly visible but it was no easier to account for than when up the valley every divergent range and every spur on such ranges in this district have a sloping side and a precipitous side thus in all the branches of the karangarua this is most evident for instance on the range between the twain and the main branch i was able on the karangarua side to walk up a bare slope of smooth rock only interrupted in places by a bluff or low cliff running across or down it but the vast precipices on the twain side not only appear to be impossible to scale but are equally hard to describe again in the twain we have the slope of the douglas neve to the summit of the range on the southern side but in the copeland valley the same range drops in enormous cliffs on to welcome flats between the copeland river and cook's we find on the southern side of the copeland range comparatively long spurs but on the northern there are inaccessible cliffs of copeland peak which i attempted to describe in a former chapter take one example of the spurs of these divergent ranges namely the ridge between regina creek and twain gorge here we find a slope varying from thirty two degrees to thirty six degrees and in a few places a trifle more on the twain side but regina creek is walled in on that bank by steep precipices the slope on the karangarua range is the same as the dip of the rock and it is probable that the great precipices are due to the fracture of the formation unfortunately however i am not sufficiently well grounded in geology to attempt a solution or explanation of this peculiarity therefore having described it to the best of my ability i shall leave it for others to explain for studying the action of ancient glaciers on mountains and valleys this river and its branches give as good opportunities as any district i know from the inflow of the copeland river to castles flat the valley is roughly speaking a mile wide filled with glacial deposit which descends in gentle slopes from the lower part of the hills to the centre of the valley through this moraine drift the river has cut a channel leaving terraces on each side from twenty feet to nearly one hundred feet high while its course is full of large erratic blocks in some places completely blocking the valley the top of the terrace is chiefly flat for some chains back cut through here and there by deep channels and generally covered with large boulders at the end of the spur opposite the inflow of the copeland river the glacial drift is piled up for some four hundred feet while the spur itself above and behind the drift shows in places ice smoothed rock the slopes of mount mcgloin and other mountains into castles flat have been described in a former chapter above the flat the valley narrows to half its original width 
and the whole floor rises abruptly for twelve hundred feet, the ancient ice having evidently come down in an ice fall at this point. The faces of the abrupt step in the valley are rounded and smooth, forming what might be called whalebacks. From this point to the saddle, the valley has been cut out of hard, nice rock, and has high bare cliffs on the south, and smooth rocky slopes on the left, while the floor is of the same rock, and slopes gently down on the south, from the foot of the precipices to the river, broken here and there by terraces. In the upper portion of the valley, from Lame Duck Flat to the saddle, the rock floor has been covered with moranic drift, as the ancient glacier retreated up the valley, and debris from the hillsides. In places, the whole surface of soil and boulders has slipped away, leaving naked rock slopes. At Lame Duck Flat, the river runs on a smooth rocky bottom, and from here to the bar below Castle's Flat, it is evidently met with less obstruction, and, flowing over rock unprotected by debris, has gradually cut the floor down to its present level. After leaving this flat, the river descends gradually through the dovetail gorge to the great cataracts, leaving behind it on the left a rock terrace, which gradually grows in height as the river descends, until at the cataract it is upward of three hundred feet high. From the top of this terrace there is a gentle slope, for a few hundred yards back, of smooth rock, interrupted by two or three terraces, to the foot of the great solid precipices, which rise from one to two thousand feet above. This was evidently the old valley bottom, abraded by the ice. In places where a creek comes down to join the river, broad roads of bare rock have been cleared by the water through the trees, interrupted by a few waterfalls, and on reaching the terrace drop over into the river making picturesque cascades. Picturesque, because the rock is worn, into fantastic grooves and channels. The actual cataracts are, I imagine, due to the large erratic blocks, left behind by the ice in its retreat, forming a bar across the valley, and the hills being too steep to hold them, they have fallen and accumulated at the bottom. These have gradually collected in the gorge as the water has cut away the ground underneath, and, having collected, are now preventing the water from further deepening the gorge. The stones in the cataracts of the three branches, meeting in castles, are of immense size. It is possible that large blocks of rock have broken away and come down from the hill on the right bank, and also slips may have helped to form the Karangarua cataract, but the other two, Twain River and Regina Creek, are solely due to large boulders left by the old glacier. There is a curious freak of nature, which I have not mentioned before, on the main branch. In the gorge, by the great cataract, the bush, as in all other valleys, is composed of large rata, kamahi, totra, and miro trees. But suddenly on the south bank this class of timber ceases, and the mountain birch begins. The line of demarcation is very marked, and neither class of tree encroaches on the other. On the north bank, the usual rata forest continues, with only two or perhaps three birch trees on that side, but on the south bank the latter have absolute possession till the Theodore Falls and Creek are reached just above Lame Duck Flat. Here they cease, as suddenly as they began, and the usual mountain vegetation continues on both sides to the head of the river. On Christmas Flat, however, a clump of about a dozen large birch trees can be seen towering above the low mountain scrub. It is a curious freak of nature, and I can see no reason for it. The real birch forest country does not commence for some distance south of this river, and this isolated patch of birch forest is the only I know of in this district. Judging from the general appearance and formation of this part of the country, I believe that in the remote past an immense ice field existed south of Mount Sefton and discharged itself in three mainstream seawards. The low saddle of the Douglas Pass would form no obstacle to the junction of the ice fields off Sefton and those further south. Even assuming that the limit of the ice smooth surfaces coincides with the level of the ancient glaciers, and that they were no higher than these marks are now found, the streams of ice flowing from this central field must have been of great depth, for they have left marks with great distinctiveness in the Twain and Karangarua valleys. The spur from Mount Glorious, which divides the Twain and Regina Creek valleys, has a high rocky hill of conical shape rising at its extremity some 3,700 feet above Castle's Flat. Behind this is a low, flat-topped depression, and it seems evident that the most northern stream of ice flowed down the Twain Valley and covered the lower end of this spur, being joined by a small glacier from the north, down Regina Valley. The central stream came over the Karangarua Pass and down the main valley, 
joining the northern stream in Castle's Flat. It then flowed against the hill on which we are now supposed to be, close to Mount MacDonald, and has, I think, left its mark in the number of large blocks which lie on the side in places. Then, turning in a northerly direction, it would join forces with a great glacier which filled the valley of the Copeland River and came over Baker's Saddle from the central neve, or the Mount Cook of that day. The combined ice flow would by this time have assumed enormous proportions, far exceeding the ancient Waiho Glacier, and larger than the old Cook River Glacier, and, flowing out onto the flats, would no doubt augment the great ice field at the base of the hills. These glaciers must all have been of considerable thickness, and it is perhaps possible that the Twain and Karangarua ice streams overflowed the ridge below point R on the map, to a slight extent, before turning towards the lower country. There is a depression in that ridge, in a direct line with a depression behind the conical hill, a line drawn from the present Douglas Glacier down the Monokai Au River, would pass through both depressions. That ice has been at work in the head of the latter river, in the past, there is ample evidence. But the most interesting and weird Roche Moutonnet at the source of that river may only be due to smaller local glacier having no distinct connection with a larger one. I am inclined to think that the above-mentioned depression here is accidental, and has no connection with the one behind the conical hill, being rather too high above sea level. Further evidence, however, is forthcoming of the great depth of ice on Ryan's Peak, which Dick and I ascended later in the season. There were two distinct lines of boulders, lying on the Copeland side of the peak at a height of over four thousand feet above the sea, which had every appearance of a lateral moraine. The ice lines, in the upper valleys of the Karangaroo and Twain, which are to be seen as high as five thousand eight hundred feet above sea level, and fully three thousand feet above the present floor of the valley, all point to the same fact. On the period of retreat beginning, the glaciers would shrink and leave behind them the great mass of moraine accumulations in the valley below Castle's Flat, and by the inflow of the Copeland River. Also, in the latter river there are large erratic blocks, scattered on the hillsides by the retreating ice. Having gradually retired up the valley and separated from the Copeland Glacier, the Twain ice would probably find its way over the low depression into Regina Creek, and, at the same time, send another stream down the gorge. Douglas, however, from what he saw at Bark Camp, is not inclined to believe that ice ever came through this gorge, but thinks it is due to a fissure in the rock formation. This I cannot agree with, for the western side has been most certainly abraded by ice, and there is a large loose boulder lying on a ledge some way up the precipice on the eastern side of the gorge. My opinion is that the Twain Glacier found its way to Castle's Flat, through this opening, long after the Karangarua had retreated above the cataracts, and is responsible for the bar of moraine which I found on the flat. I have mentioned already Crusoe's Island and Queen's Knoll, which are evidently remains of a moraine, for on following the line back towards Mount McGloin, I found other small heaps of boulders. There is in my mind, no doubt, that an ice stream came over the Karangarua Pass, for the rock is ice-worn, and large blocks scattered on its slopes. There are also three distinct ice lines in the valley, especially noticeable between the Pass and Troit River. I believe that this glacier would not be cut off from the central ice field until it had retired up the valley to Castle's Flat. But as the period of shrinkage progressed, there is no doubt that it would suddenly be separated from the main source of supply of the Karangarua Pass, which is upwards of 5,600 feet above sea level, and having no high peaks near it from which to draw fresh supplies, it would suddenly and rapidly retreat up the valley from Castle's Flat to the head, for I presume the fact of so little moranic deposit in the upper portion of this valley is due to a sudden retreat such as this. The idea of a stream of ice flowing over Baker's Saddle, 6,300 feet, is supported by the presence of sandstone blocks in the Copeland Valley from the same formation as Mount Cook. But as the main range near the footstool has some of the same rock, it is possible that these stones came from the divide between Stokes and that peak. Yet, as it has not been closely examined along there, it is hard to say. However, such a low depression as Baker's Saddle must, I think, have been an outlet for the ice of the central neve lying near the Mount Cook of that day. The third stream of ice from the supposed ice field went down the Landsborough, helped by glaciers from the Hooker and present dividing range, but whether it discharged its water westward or eastwards, I will not presume to offer an opinion. 
There seem, however, good reasons for supposing that the former range at one time formed the watershed between the two coasts. The lake of which Dan Coiti informed me is a most interesting and picturesque little alpine tarn. It lies under Mount MacDonald on the seaward side of the ridge, and is half a mile long by two hundred yards across, draining into Jacob's River. I named it Roto Lake to Coiti, after the finder. There is no bar of morainic accumulations at the lower end, but it is one of those rock basins which is difficult to explain, except on the theory that it was excavated by a glacier. The rocks, smooth and ice-worn, descend precipitously into the water, which is apparently of great depth. Unfortunately, avalanche debris and a stream from MacDonald are gradually filling it up. The vegetation, flowers, grass, and scrub in this district is the same as elsewhere in our Alps. The mountain scrub on the eastern side of the dividing range is, where it grows, as dense as that of the west coast, but is found in such small quantities that it gives little trouble. The shrubs of which it is composed are all found on the west coast, and, so far as I could discover, there are only three mountain plants which do not grow on both sides of the range. The thorny wild Irishman, Dioscaria tomato, I have never seen on the west coast Alps, while in the Tasman Valley it grows with great luxuriance. The Nainai, said to be a heath and incense plant, a myrtle, of which I have found only two specimens, are both peculiar to the Westland Alps. The latter has a larger leaf, and the shrub is much smaller in size than the mountain musk, which flourishes on both sides of the Alps. The former I have already described in Chapter 5. While talking of plants, there is a very awkward sword-grass, Asaphila colensoi, which we call the Spaniard. It has bayonet-shaped leaves two feet or more long, which will sometimes pierce the leather of a boot, and at all times, when one is going through the long snow-grass, it will make its presence known in a most unpleasant and unmistakable manner. Without having made a complete collection of the numerous alpine flowers, it is of course impossible to say whether there are any peculiar to either side of the divide, but I am inclined to think that there is no difference in this respect. There are many flowering plants found on the Alps in Westland, which are not found, or at least are not common, in the Tasman district, but they flourish in other localities on the eastern side. The great majority of New Zealand alpine flowers are white. In fact, there are comparatively few colored ones. The most beautiful is the now well-known mountain lily, Ranunculus lyallii, which is the finest alpine flower I have seen in any country. Besides this, there are three or four kinds of ranunculus, some of which are bright yellow, and more plentiful on the western ranges than the eastern. Three or four kinds of daisies, or salmisias, are met with in great luxuriance, above 3,500 feet in Westland. The finest of these has a white flower, with a yellow center, and grows to three inches in diameter. Their broad, silvery-green leaves are over a foot in length, and are pure white underneath. This white underleaf can be stripped off, and resembles thin white kid, and if it is twisted and knotted into a short string, it is almost unbreakable. I have found the stripping of one leaf strong enough, when rolled between my fingers, to stand the strain of as hard a pull as either Dick or I could give. The grass which grows on the Alps is coarse and long, but makes good pasturage, after it has been once burnt, though care has to be taken that it is not burnt in the wrong season, or it will never grow again. It only seeds once in three years, so far as I have observed. We call this snow grass the climber's friend, because it is absolutely safe to catch hold of when going over the Alp, and no ordinary weight or pull will uproot it. Edelmice, of a different kind to that growing in Switzerland, but very pretty, is to be found in great profusion from 3,000 to 6,000 feet above sea level, and several varieties of gentians are to be met with on the lower Alps. Douglas talks of an anemone, which he once saw, but we have never found any in flower while together. It is a brilliant yellow, and he says, as beautiful a plant as he has ever seen. However, not having myself found a specimen, it is difficult to say what it is, or whether it is peculiar to one locality only. I do not consider the subalpine flora of New Zealand equal, as a whole, to that of Switzerland, for though the Ranunculaceae and Salmisias are perhaps finer than anything on the Alps of Europe, the smaller plants are not so varied, plentiful, or brilliant. We never see an Alp here showing such a blaze of color as those in some parts of the European mountains. Taking the central portion of the southern Alps as a whole, I should say that vegetation ceases at 6,200 feet above sea level, 
Isolated instances are found of its reaching 6,600 feet, or even more. I have found a small patch of edelweiss at 6,800 feet, and Douglas reports that he once found a, quote, single pale yellow anemone growing on a bare patch surrounded by snow at an altitude of nearly 8,000 feet, end quote. This, I think, must be considered too exceptional to take into account, and is probably only a seedling growing for that one season. However, it was not in the district now under consideration. Birds and insects are fairly plentiful in the high Alps, and I believe in every case are common to both sides of the range. The highest life that I have found, except the blowfly, Califera, which follows one everywhere, is a black weta, Hemidina, and a black butterfly, Peronodamon Pluto. The former has a body nearly an inch long, and delicate antennae, an inch and a half in length. I have found them walking or hopping over a snowfield some 8,500 feet above sea level on Mount de la Beche, and Mannering reports that he has found them still higher, on rocks where even lichens have ceased to exist. The black butterfly has a slow lazy flight at a high altitude, but when found on the lower glaciers it is as lively as most of its kind. Grasshoppers are plentiful on the grass, and also green lizards, nultinus, which grow to a considerable size. The commonest of all insects is the moraine spider. They are large black fellows, and are seen in hundreds on lateral moraines, and I have rarely found a patch of surface moraine, however isolated, without one spider living like Robinson Crusoe on his desert island. How a spider could have found its way to a patch of moraine, surrounded by a mile at least of broken and crevassed ice, is difficult to say. And what he lives on when he has reached it is a still more difficult question. On the Franz Joseph, broken and crevassed as it is, we found numbers of these insects on the middle of the glacier far away from moraine. Douglas acknowledges the same difficulty in attempting to explain their presence in the midst of all these crevasses, but puts forward a few suggestions. Perhaps, he says, they have lost themselves. Perhaps they are practicing for a polar expedition, a sort of arachnida nasani. But the puzzle is, how do they cross these crevasses? Why do they not get their feet frozen? I dare say, while the sun is shining, they are comfortable enough, quietly freezing towards evening, and thawing out again next day to proceed on their journey. We saw no dead ones. When chased, they go tumbling down a deep crevasse, as if it was a haven of refuge for oppressed spiders. Whether they ever come back, I cannot say. While on this glacier, we found some small insects in the pools on the ice, near the icefall, which were black, and about an eighth of an inch long. They took refuge in the minute cells in the ice. No doubt they were the larvae of some insect, but the pools would freeze solid every night, so I do not quite understand why their parents chose such cold quarters for them. Besides the kia, the only bird found in localities surrounded by ice and snow, is the little mountain wren, Seneca Silvestris, a peculiar inquisitive little fellow, with no tail and thin, comparatively long legs, on which he hops from stone to stone, or hummock to hummock on the ice coming quite close to one, bowing and bobbing, like a little machine. I have never seen him quiet for a moment. This bird always reminds me of a feathered walnut on two thin white sticks, about two inches long, which have a spring in them worked by clockwork. They are found everywhere in the high Alps and on the west coast, but for some hours before rain they collect in flocks and descend to the bush line, where they flutter about in company with the canaries, keeping up a bewildering chirping. When on Castle's Flat I saw a pretty little owl, from three to four inches in height. It had strayed from its hole in the daylight, and was so dazzled that it made no attempt to escape. Rather foolishly, I did not shoot it, for it seemed a pity to kill so harmless and pretty a bird. Since returning to Christchurch, I have ascertained that though reports of such an owl have been made before, no specimen has ever been obtained. This, however, is not a dweller in high country. Owing to the very small allowance made by government for the work of exploration, we were unable to carry proper appliances and materials for collecting flowers and insects. Had we been allowed a larger party, there is no doubt that a most exhaustive collection could have been made during our wanderings over the Alps, and a most satisfactory description given of vegetable and insect life. I have only here attempted to put forward a general idea of the most interesting features in this direction. End of chapter 16